Hello and welcome to the Good, the Scars and the Rugby brought to you by our friends at Vodafone. We have literally just wrapped up watching WXV1 and the award ceremony uh, that came immediately after it. And I am at my sister's house in Cape Town, which means you will get dogs barking and potential baby shouts in between here but i'm sure that your life is probably even more chaotic than mine uh, one person who's got everything under control and came through for us as player of the match today uh, nick heath it's not you scanzi we'll get to you uh, nick heath <laughs> joins us uh, the guy whose voice you usually hear first on the good the scars and the rugby i uh, had the final say today because we had Problems with our The Good, The Scouts and Rugby Instagram Live, um, despite using it to aplomb yesterday and last week. Uh, on this uh, Saturday, IG Live was sleeping in. And uh, we had to jump onto Nick Heath's YouTube channel. He gracefully hosted uh, and just took the baton with uh, just such grace and charm. And he comes with bonus painted nails at, these sta- at this stage of his life. I love that he's in this era. Uh, yellow and black nails, we'll get to that. And Emily Scarron, the big, big headline uh, beyond the fact that she's been shouting England <laughs> nonstop since uh, the final whistle there, is uh, that our Scars has downloaded YouTube. <laughs> and we would just like to say, we are so proud of you, Scars. You have grown in ways we could never have imagined. She has got YouTube installed on her phone, ladies and gentlemen. She did so while watching the rugby and bellowing England at the TV. How are we doing, for- Scazzy? Forget um, the World Rugby Awards. What do I get for that, honestly? <laughs> oh, I, I just, you know how it is. I'm not great at these things. And obviously, as soon as we needed to do the old switcheroo to a different platform, I just got my head around Instagram. I was having a heart attack that it was your Instagram that was wrong, Elmer, and that I was going to have to be the lead. And God only knows what would have happened then. Thankfully, Nick steps in. I've now got YouTube downloaded and I mean, I'm, I'm back. I'm back up to date, I think. Nick, I've described you as our bomb squad before, but I think <laughs> this is literally the best way. And um, binge use would just be derogatory. <laughs> I mean, I'll take it. I'll take whatever. I was very happy to step in. I, I was in the seat that I hosted Nick's pub quiz in throughout the two years of lockdown. So it sort of all started, started flooding back. I mean, you know, Skaz froze for a bit. I was chatting to people who were leaving comments. I thought, I don't know that if I need the other two, I can just do this on my own, chatting to people who are logging in. It'll just be called The Nick, The Nick and The Nick. Um, Maybe a (laughs) spin-off. It's worth exploring. Shira, call me. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely loved it. And I love that Almo had a stormer of a game. Can we just, like, we need to start on that note. Uh, review on the Mohan special. You spoke to her last night slash New Zealand morning time, Scousy. What did she sound like? Yeah, she was in really good spirits. I called her on the way home last night because it was about midnight. Um, so they were kind of just just before their lunchtime, evening kickoff, long days. I thought she might, might need someone to chat to, but she's in really good spirits. I asked her how she was feeling. She was like, yeah. I'm just excited and like you know with Mo when she's kind of bubbling like that that she's always going to have a good game and that's where she is when she's in a good place so um, yeah she binned me off to go to lunch um, but she just had her hair plaited Lark was doing the the rounds as she always does Um, she was taking the mick out of Zoe Oldcroft and her hair because I think it was a bit tight or something but um, yeah it was it was nice to speak to her she was in great spirits and she put out a really good performance I was really pleased. It was such a joy to watch her play like that and um, I think, Nick, your article about Mo in the lead up to this game just contextualized the significance of this opportunity for her. For a lot of people who might have gotten distracted or looked away, this was not just coming back from the disappointment of not being in New Zealand last year. It's a story that has an arc that stretches so much further back. Uh, when you were deciding what you were going to write for Rugby Pass this week, why where did this idea come from to write about Mo's story I think you know she's spoken so eloquently on here um and she did a great interview with uh with Gloucester Hartbury and, and online over the summer um about the sort of recent trials and tribulations obviously missing out on that World Cup squad but we know that actually in 2021 she stepped away because things weren't right in camp and that wasn't all her, you know. There were there were issues within relationships there. 
that I think were, were coming from from other places potentially within that coaching setup. And and people weren't, I believe, making the most of the Mo Hunt that we all know, the person that, that won that 2014 Rugby World Cup and that is the connectivity element in the clubs that she plays for um, from club all the way through. Um, and as, as Scans will know, and as plenty of the, of the girls who play with her at club and country will say, it's about what she does for the girls. It's about that relationship. And and so it, I thought to myself, well, actually, bearing in mind these big games that there have been over the last year or two, some of which she has been involved in, but obviously not involved in the World Cup, I thought, I wonder when she last faced New Zealand. So I started to look back through it and realised that the last one was the 2017 Rugby World Cup final in Belfast, which is absurd given the talent that she has. Um, so I just thought it was worth pointing that out. I'd asked Lewis Deacon on the England presser this week if there'd been any talk of revenge in the squad. He said, genuinely, it hasn't come up at all. It's not a word we've even said. And I just thought, well, actually, for one player, it's definitely redemption. It's being given the chance to play to an England game plan that suits her skills, um, that is not being handed three minutes off the bench against France in front of 60,000, which for me was one of the most disgraceful moves from a coaching box I've ever witnessed. Um, and uh, and I thought it was it was about time to celebrate that actually this is a mature England coaching team who are willing to give her her opportunity and to express herself and for her to see with all of her skills what's going on on a rugby field and not to just do something uh, so prescriptive. You may tell I'm quite passionate about this. But um, yeah, I just thought it was it was worth highlighting that it's been a journey, some of which we know, some of which uh, we might not. But, but ultimately... We're at a point now, and I think it's great to to have heard what Scar said about that phone call. She is buzzing. She is wanting to play. She's wanting to go out there. She want, she's wanting to do it. And that display for me today wasn't Mo trying to impress and remind us all what she's capable of in eight or 12 minutes off the bench. It was a calm, secure, world-class performance at the top level against the world champions. And yeah, some of it was getting the ball away, letting Holly Aitchison and the backs do their work. Others were seeing what was on little chip kick over the top, um, and I think I think it it sort of it was all really written in the stars when I went down to the England training camp during the summer and saw Lou Meadows, um, and she leaned into me and said, "We're letting her kick and everything," and I thought that sort of said it all. I love that. I love that. Talk to me about this new game plan. New Zealand just couldn't deal with England. It was, I mean, it was frightening. The the, the England that came out of the sheds for the first half an hour. And New Zealand couldn't launch a lineup. They couldn't find touch. I mean, just nothing was on. What has changed, Scazzy, outside of bringing in Mo to start and the, the, the level of variety and the maturity and the confidence with which she did what she did? What's new? I think just a confidence across the side, the whole team, um, and a, a togetherness in, in that sense. And not to say there's never been a togetherness or a confidence, but I think... The way that the girls came out, certainly in that that first five minutes, 10 minutes was unbelievable. Um, I, you know, everyone always talks about wanting to start fast, wanting to start physical, wanting to get on top and and all that sort of stuff. And both sides will have said that, but it's often, you know, easier said than done. Um, but the way they charged into it, it was really simple as well. It wasn't, you know, trying to go wide too early. It wasn't about doing anything particularly flash, but what they did do was win collisions ferociously. Sarah Byrne running over the top of people, Moen Italic, Alex Matthews, all of those guys. And then when actually when it was on and they were free because they had won those collisions, then the offloads were also on and the players were there supporting them because they know that that's now an, a, an option and an opportunity for this England side. So I think it just... Like it, it, that first 20 minutes was so complete and it was never going to be sustainable for the whole game. And the Black Ferns were always going to have their moment. They were always going to have their patch in the game where they, they would come back and inevitably score a try and, and fine. But I just thought the England girls were unreal in terms of how they started that game. And New Zealand looked shell-shocked. Like, you know, when a, a front row forward's going down in the first 15, 20 minutes, quite clearly taking a... A, a tactical break pretending their elbows hurt you know that there's you know words are being said um and completely right like we would be doing the exact same if that was us um but yeah just it, they're just girls are just so on top of it nick you have a really interesting theory on the game plan and we don't know how much to read into john mitchell's presence but he could have already started having an impact here is that your thought 
Yeah, well, certainly speaking to the coaches over the summer, um, you know, we, we can get granular in this kind of thing. But but very briefly, you might see patterns when the ball goes across a rugby field that it'll go from a ball or a ruck and it'll go to three forwards stood together and they'll truck up and then get tackled and then maybe they'll pass out to one person. There are these formations called, you know, one, three, three, one or one, two, three, whatever. What England are trying to do at the minute is just try and find more width and they're putting a big forward out in the really wide channels to also do the carry and also stretch a defensive line so that the, the opposition forwards have to go out there, which creates more holes in midfield. But but what they're also trying to do is to get a kicking strategy so that when they kick to an opposition, it's not necessarily about what that pressure does during that kick. Yes, that might be a contestable kick opportunity, but they're actually wanting the opposition to kick back to them so that they can then be ready to strike and use their patterns to find the space that might be on. And I think it's coming together. And, and Lewis Deacon, I thought really tellingly in his post-match interview um, after that Black Ferns game, just said, I'm really pleased because we really delivered the game plan. And and through the summer, he was saying, it's going to take a little while. Um, anyone who watched Japan during the Men's Rugby World Cup, that is the same structure. That is what John Mitchell wants to bring to this England team. So he's been feeding it through while Lewis Deacon's interim head coach and alongside Lou Meadows. Um, and now, obviously, he's joined them in New Zealand and, and still sort of stayed back from, from frontline duties in terms of, of facing up. But he's obviously been in there helping tweak that game plan. And I think we really saw that today. And, and I also think, just to finish on this, that you have to have a team that have the nous an ability to pull off these more technical game plans. And having been professional for longer, having gone through a relationship with coaching that started with Gary Street and, and Graham Smith, came through Simon Middleton and, and had more technical stuff added to it, I think it's a sophistication of game plan that needs athletes at the very top. And I think it will evolve through the rest of the women's game that other nations will now go, well, hold on a minute. We actually have to step up here. We actually have to think a bit better. We have to respect that the athletes can take a lot more on. And I think you can see in Wales, while they're a little bit further back, that is also now just beginning to come through. Sorry, who was that? Uh, that was Anna. She's got thoughts. Uh, as I said, I'm at my sister's house and uh, there's a very professional guard dog here shouting at the neighbours for opening the gate. How very dare they do this. The other thing, one of my favourite highlights at the end of the game was Sarah Hunter looking so emotional. Now, I don't want anyone to ever be in distress, but it clearly means so much to her being in New Zealand, having had the experience she's had both in 21, but also in 17, Scazzy. The emotion surprised some people, but I guess that if you think about the journey that Sarah Hunter has been on, she was the losing captain in that final last year and she had to do that post-match interview that made all of us cry and now she gets to be there in the coaching box with the closest seat to it's a bit of redemption for her as well right yeah it's a hard one like we won't actually ever know quite why that emotion poured out of her and she might not even know because it's potentially just a reactionary thing being back in New Zealand um you know going through so much this time last year and going through so much within that year as well in terms of her role change the energy she's put in the the hard work all of that sort of stuff not being able to control anything anymore in terms of being on the field like I think that's often a really hard thing Kendra spoke about it last week when you when you're not part of a squad anymore you have no physical control you try to prepare the team as best you can but ultimately you're not quite sure what's going to happen out there the girls have got to deliver and um yeah like I I'm so chuffed a bit to her she part of it will be just pure pride in what the girls have gone on and achieved um you know she's always been so proud wearing that white shirt and now wearing I suppose a, a blue coaching top or whatever it is but um it will be a huge amount of pride um and, and just showcasing actually what this team are capable of um Nick and I were speaking earlier probably a little bit of relief as well that he mentioned in terms of just being able to one, get the win. Two, her defence held up really well. Um, and three, maybe a little bit of, of that redemption piece from from last year. And, and as I say, we won't quite know what that emotion was, but she's a hell of a person. Now, so I'm really thrilled that she's part of that journey now. It's probably just a, whew, okay, I've got through this period and these are five W's on the board. You you can't really ask for better than that. And, and, and to start your international coaching journey and for those opposition to be the, the inside the top five opponents in the world and get that record is uh, is phenomenal. Now, let's talk about the World Rugby Awards. 
pod de <laughs> that took place post match uh, through the lens of our fave Party Packer. Because Party Packer was described by the World Rugby website. I just have to read this. England captain Molly Packer is a relentless force in the back row, leading by example with her tough defense, but equally adept in attack, and is the leading try scorer in women's test rugby this year with 11. Considering stiff competition has been faced, there have been some really challenging ones over the last year. Uh, can we take a moment for Party Packer um, and her de two plats up hairstyle today? She she was just personified energy for me. The, everything we saw from England in the first 30 was also everything you saw from Molly Packer. Yeah, she always leads from the front. Um, and it's, it's kind of the cliche thing to say when she's captain as well. But but she genuinely does. Like Every scrum, you could hear her shouting through the ref mic at the girls, getting the girls ramped up. That is that is literally what she brings. Obviously, energy around the field, but also energy through her communication as well. I thought that, to be fair, that the whole pack was amazing. But she is a huge driver in that. I'm really thrilled that, that she's won that award. Um, I think, you know, she's probably been in and around it for a few years um and she's been an unbelievable player for a long time like we played under 19s under 20s together god knows how many years ago um and and she was that person then um and she's you know she's carried that through she's probably only got better and now so ably supported with the people around her as well at Sarri's, she's massive um i'm sure when she returns to club she'll she'll continue that form just a a little note for uh, Gabrielle Vernier. I thought she's been amazing all year as well. Um, she can't have been too far away from, from winning that award um, for France. She's a an unbelievable player, played against quite closely for a long time. Um, she punches well above um, and I'm sure she'll probably go on and, and win this award on, on another date. But yeah, just a, a little shout out to her because she's been phenomenal. Let's uh, quickly rattle through the other ones. Breakthrough and women's try of the year. Caitlin Vahakolo from New Zealand made her debut against Australia in the World Rugby Pack 4 series. A constant threat, pace and footwork scored today. Congratulations uh, to her. Um, and then International Rugby Players Women's Try of the Year. This is a conversation we had before we went live here. Uh, three tries from the Women's Six Nations making the shortlist. One from the Pacific Four Series. And Sophia Stefan from Italy winning for a try against Ireland on the 15th of April. Um, it's a bit of a, it's a question here around categories and nominations and what, uh, qualifies as try of the year do you want it to be an individual effort or do you feel like it should be team effort and then just nominate the whole team how are we how, where are we on this nick well i think producer shira um certainly i'm i'm in agreement with her i think it's interesting that if you've got an individual finishing off a team try then how much is the value of having an individual try scorer award? Now, we know rugby's a team game. You can always argue that an individual try is, is, is the result of a team effort, but you do often see those, those fabulous moments. And, and it also makes me think of, you know, you, that, that, that old thing of if, if you're a, a rubbish garage band and you've got a great song, but you've recorded it on a terrible cassette, you can still see, you can still hear if it's a great song, even if the production wasn't great. And similarly, there would have been an awful lot of brilliant tries scored, probably in lower tiers than the very beautifully polished production and broadcasts of something like the Six Nations. And and how much effort has been done by World Rugby to look at those other competitions, other competitions in Africa, to, to name check John Birch, who I know at Scrum Queens has, has made a point about this. Um, it it did it did seem almost a little too obvious that the sort of three, four tries that we've had as the nominees have just been ones that have, that have come from what I might say are quite obvious games. Having been part of the production team who made the Try of the Year nomination films last year, there was a South African one in last year that looked like it was filmed on a Nokia 5110. Um, and I love that. I mean, I didn't love it for us. Technically, this is a nightmare working with footage that's like grainy and, you know, not great. But the fact that you can still see that it's a great try, despite the quality of the footage, uh, absolutely shines through as a beaming light and an example. And it also, the quality um, being acknowledged means so much for teams who don't get a lot of really high quality coverage because it makes players at all levels feel like if I shine, it will be noticed somewhere. 
Yeah, I completely agree. I think the and this is a, a wider frustration that I think we all share is just like how how it's been announced and where where that's come from. Like we obviously all watched the end of the England New Zealand game where we saw the breakthrough player of the year and the player of the year and the team of the year announced. But even when we were all chatting, we were like, oh, who won try of the year? Because because we don't know. Like the obviously the award ceremony was uh, last weekend after the the men's final um obviously these these uh the other awards were given out at the end of the game because those players were present and it was obviously Italy WXV2 weren't there but they're the winning try for that so they, I think it's just like it's a, it, it's frustrating and I just I just feel for those players because having been to a couple of world rugby awards they're amazing things glitz and glamour and, and yes that's not everybody's cup of tea but it's about the recognition of those individuals of those teams of our wider game all of those sorts of things that I think is really important um and it's such a shame that you know we spoke about it when Kendra was on last week and Elmer you made the point around especially in men's world cup years the spotlight and the attention that those awards get is is also far more because the you know all of the the eyes are on the rugby world at that point and I just think it's a it's it's just a real shame and I feel for those guys um yeah, I, I don't know what the plan is moving forward. I hope this does change things and, and we're able to look at it more deeply and, and put in a better plan. Um, but yeah, Sophia Stefan, like when's she going to receive her award? Nobody knows. I was messaging someone last week when they said, oh, why aren't the women's awards happening now? And I was like, well, it's happening next week. I'm assuming it's going to be an equally glamorous and glitzy affair with a full pre-show, um, a location in Auckland that's very similar uh, to the L'Opera uh, in Paris and that we're going to have everybody in their finery and that, that the women's game will, I'm sure, be put on the same pedestal as the men's. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's happening. Is it happening? I think it will be Party Packer with her trophy and a beer in some downtown Auckland <laughs> bar, I think. Join Packet her there. Of Pringles on the bar. Join her there. Can we get Illy Kildan to go live or like Morty or someone <laughs> just so that we can also attend vicariously through? Well, I mean, the gram is, is showing everyone flames today. So, okay, scrap that. They'll have to go to YouTube. Let's quickly chat about the World Rugby Women's 15's Dream Team of the Year. We don't have to go through the whole team, but... Just for interest, the split is six New Zealand players, seven England players, and two French players. I can tell you, South Africa has not processed the fact that they only have one man in the men's dream team. (laughs) And I hope Canada smarts as much about Sophie de Goody not getting a slot in this because Canada finished second on the log at the end of WXV1. It's going to be interesting. I mean, they're they're on this format now, obviously, for next year as well. Rumours that... that WXV1 could be over the channel, possibly. Thought it might be coming to England. Could could be over in France, if, if the whispers are to be true. Um, and, you know, I think... But I think it's going to stay as it is until we get to, to post-2025. And then I think they'll look at, at what 26 and 28 will look like and, and whether it'll be tweaked from there. So I think we've, we've just got to... We're going to have to suck up the current tournament format as it is. That's very interesting. He just dropped a really big bombshell there, if you haven't heard it. Uh there are, there are whispers, as he says, uh, that WXV next year, WXV1, might require a Schengen visa for the South African passport holder here, uh, but also for us to hop onto the Eurostar. I mean, we'll just have to go and eat some croissants for us. It's a tough life. Um, I'm so keen. I've been really impressed with Australia. Again, I thought we saw signs of it in um, the England game in terms of the game plan that they're quite clearly trying to put in place in terms of playing a bit more, you know, they have a brilliant kind of touch and sevens background in, in Australia. Therefore their ability to pass the ball is, is amazing. And they've actually started to really harness that move the ball around. They've got some phenomenally powerful players through the middle. Um, and, you know, I think Shui said it yesterday in terms of how a side can be galvanised when, unfortunately, they do go down to 14, 13 players. And they obviously had it as well against England with Annabelle Cody getting uh, simbined and eventually red carded. So I think, um, you know, sometimes, and, and last game of the tour as well, sometimes you're just like, right, well, let's let's just rip in. Let's give this everything. Let's try and, you know, maybe take away from a game what they think they, they perhaps deserve and perhaps what they could have got out of other games as well. So... I think for Australia, it's, they've probably been the most, um, arguably the most impressive this tournament in terms of the results they've had, how far they've come on, given 
you know, their background and the fact that they don't spend loads of time together and their coach isn't even professional and all of that sort of stuff. I'm going to draw a slight parallel between the Wales women team and the Scotland men's team. Um, because there is a question, I think, at this point for the progression that the Wales uh, team are making is that I think I think arguably they do have somewhere to go, but I found it you know a, a little saddening on their behalf that they came to this WHV1 tournament, they feel like their progression is going well, yet they've come away without any wins. And I think a lot of people have referred to the Scotland men's team as having got as high as they possibly can. Yes, wrong side of the draw, all that stuff. But they're just not, with their resources and with their ability and player depth, quite going to break into that top four in the world. And and certainly that proved to be at the World Cup, despite them being ranked fifth in the world going into it. And so I think, you know, I think for the, for the Wales women as well, we have to look at where they can be developing and bringing new players through, what something like the PWR can do to develop those players, but what also other club systems in Wales can be doing because there was a sort of sense that is this as good as this Wales team are going to be on this global stage with where they're at in their development and, and how and when will they be able to move it up a level or two to, to start taking these results that they haven't been able to this, this time around. I'm really excited to see them uh, during the Six Nations. And I think there's so much talent coming through. It's just bubbling under. Um, and the kind of impact they've had over the last year and the kind of support they've seen and the, the number of girls I've seen go out to, to go watch their games and um, the way that they're developing their fan base. Um, I feel like they're probably just a, a bit off. Oh, who's that? <gasps> it's Mo's Little Mo's it's calling. Mo's if... She's going to pie me now. Mo. <laughs> Scuzzy sing a song. If your name is Scuzzy, sing a song. If your name is Scuzzy, name is Scuzzy, name is Scuzzy, sing a song. Hello, mate. <laughs> Hello, Mo. 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 Hello, Mo.
Yeah, um, I think Sam Monaghan's got to be up there. Uh, she was co-captain of that Ireland side. She's in that Gloucester Hartbury side alongside Mo. Uh, she was great. It was just nice to see an Ireland side with smiles on their faces. Yes, their opposition will not have tested them as much as, as some will in the Six Nations, but Scott Beeman there wants to just get smiles on faces, wants to get the players believing in themselves. They're working really hard on the, on the structure there as well with Sean Ryan. Um, so it was just really satisfying. You don't want to see these teams suffering and being unhappy. Um, I don't want to see Rachel Malcolm cry in a post-match interview anymore. All, all these sorts of things, whether it's Scotland, whether it's Ireland, these teams that can have a tough time of it as other nations uh, go on to get wins. So I was was delighted for them. Um, Maria Raswaga from uh, Colombia, um, really handy player for them, definitely one to keep an eye on. And Grace Okulu, uh, who was awesome for Kenya. They had her on the bench uh, during yeah. the game that, that they played, that she played against Kazakhstan. Um, came on and absolutely blew, blew everyone away. Um, probably slightly overplayed at times, but um, I think she is Kenya's Emily Scarrett. She's rangy. She had the ability, physicality, offloads. She uh, She's going to be a whole heap of fun on the international stage because these teams are now getting more game time and this is what it's all about. Yay! Ta-da! Uh, WXV2 Awards uh, are hosted by Cape Town in splendid fashion. So a special word of mention to the people of my home city. Um, and also Bagpipe Energy for Scotland winning! Ooh. <laughs> Didn't miss my cue. Didn't miss my cue. <laughs> yeah. So good. So good for Scotland. She pulled the bagpipe, uh, what, what do you call that, charades, out of the pocket there. But uh, there is no bagpipe music accompanying it. Apologies. Uh, we will still figure that out. And on the topic of uh, us celebrating people, uh, talk to us about Gary Street, Nick, because you have such a deep heart for people when they need the rest of us to rally around. For those who don't know who Gary Street is, let's maybe start there. And what is his health condition, his state at the moment? Yeah, so uh, Gary Street will be, uh, well, a man that Emily Scarrett will have a longer relationship with than I do because he was uh, involved in, as an assistant coach with England for a number of years before he then took on the head coach job. He was assisted by Graham Smith um, and Smithy actually, yes, good, a shout out for Smithy there from Anna. Um, and uh, Smithy actually just recently celebrated 30 years uh, as a professional coach. So a shout out to Smithy. Um, but yeah, Gary Street was the England rugby head coach of the Red Roses in 2014 when they went and won that Rugby World Cup in Paris. Um, I was on the bus away from the stadium with him because I was in-house doing videography at the time and he had a little tear in his eye as he sat at the front of the bus and clutched that cup. Um, you could tell how much the journey and the pain of 2010 uh, had had played a part in then that winning of 2014. One of the nicest guys, a little bit like that uncle who does the sort of broken finger trick and tweaks you by the ear. Um, he loves doing his magic tricks with players and Kay Wilson falling for every single one of them. Um, but unfortunately, earlier this year, he had uh, a bit of a heart, bit of heart trouble. He's gone in for an operation um, and there were complications through the operation as well that uh, resulted in having a stroke. Um, so Gary is not has not been in the best place over the last couple of months. I have spoken to his wife, Flip, and uh, and she is happy for me to, to share this information. So basically what we want is everybody around uh, the women's rugby world to keep Streety in their thoughts. Um, he is working through his recovery, um, but it is going to be long. He's got limited movement and, and speech and things are, are hopefully coming back uh, as we speak. But it is going to be a fairly tough road ahead. So I'm sure there will be, you know, plenty of care and opportunity uh, for Streety once he gets home uh, from hospital. But it may be that the brilliant rugby family, as they usually do, can rally round and we can consider ways of perhaps raising a few extra funds so that he can continue to get the care that he's going to need over the course of the next year and, and beyond. Um, but look, Streety, a message from, from everybody. We are thinking of you. Uh, we hope you're going to continue on this road. We know you're a fighter. You've taught many players how to keep fighting. Um, and we know that you're certainly capable of it. So, uh, yeah, just to let everybody know uh, that uh, that we should all keep him in, in our thoughts and uh, and perhaps over the course of, of the next few months or year or so, we'll work out some ways to all get together, have some fun and raise a few pennies uh, so that he can continue to get the treatment he deserves because uh, he's a legend of the game. I love that. Thank you, Nick, for bringing that to the conversation. I really appreciate it. Um, your heart's always in the right place. Scazzy? Yeah, I just... 
similar things like obviously been thinking of streety over the last few months or so um like just a personal reflection like he he was the guy that gave me my first opportunity in terms of capping me at 18 years old um so known him for a, for a long time and yeah he's the sort of guy that that would light up a room when he came into it because of his arguably terrible jokes and um you know daft daft tricks that he used to do but but that was him that was his energy that's what he wanted to bring to a party and you know it was great to see a video that that Nick shared earlier of him still doing that albeit you know in a very different circumstance but that sense of humor still shines shines bright and shines through him so yeah just all our thoughts with him Flip and, and the boys at the moment um and hopefully wishing him well. So um we will be wrapping up the show on this very thoughtful note um about how close this uh, little family of ours is even though we might be in two different hemispheres um all of us will be back in a few weeks time uh we will be calling on the bomb squad i'm sure uh whenever the opportunity arises uh but but nick is there uh as our honorary extension of the team we will await the return of our mo and as soon as she's back on home soil and the pwr season has got up and running, uh, we will be having tons more fun this year. Uh, but thank you to you if you've been coming along on this uh, wild ride that I've been on, an uh, un- unplanned um, extended trip in France and now in South Africa, um, and for all the dog barking and the child uh, shouting and the and the different uh, locations that I've been joining you from uh, along the way. Thank you, Scazzy, for always being uh, the consistent the consistent one, even though she was on the TV uh, until very late last night. Uh, she got up really nice and early for us this morning and brought all of the energy. Uh, how does that go? More energy, more passion, more... <laughs> more footwork, more footwork. More footwork, yeah, more footwork, more energy. It's now more ingrained passion, in all our heads. Eyes. I cannot get Rocky <laughs> Clark. Tomorrow, Can Taylor. I get Rocky and Clark Rocky, and her Rocky Clark. out of my mind? <laughs> that is so good. Go look, go look at Rocky Clark's Instagram if you have no idea what we're on about. Thank you, Nick, and thank you, Scazzy. Pleasure. Thank you. And uh, we've been the Good the Scars and the Rugby in partnership with Vodafone. As always, the Good the Scars and the Rugby is a folding pocket production produced uh, by our birthday queen. It was her birthday this week. Woo! Sarah Kilgallen. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. If your name is Shara Sing a song. If your name is Shara Sing a song. If your name is Shara Sing a song.